there's something about the former president of the United States, Richard Nixon, and his complex relationship with the one-time Teamsters president, James Jimmy Hoffa, that managed to fixate a group of thieves from Ohio into planning a robbery all the way in California. And we're going to find out why. First, let's take a look back at some of the history between Nixon and Hoffa for a bit of context. From what I could find, they developed a professional and political relationship starting in the 1950s. Jimmy Hoffa was clearly a large leading force behind the typical voting direction of his union members, making him a powerful ally for those running for office, especially a presidential candidate. This was a time when our country, from a political standpoint, still respected the hard-working hands of our blue-collar communities. A time where the influence of politics wasn't always driven through the scope of corporations and rich donors with large interest groups that could pound away with the media and smearing the working class. We used to celebrate labor workers for their essential work and backbreaking jobs that still to this day make the world go around like those of truckers and bricklayers. So their votes were appreciated and essential to all candidates on both sides of the political spectrum. With their working relationship intact, Jimmy Hoffa agreed to back Richard Nixon for president during the presidential campaigns in 1960. James Hoffa's support came with an alleged gift of money totaling $1 million in the form of two $500,000 payments in cash being delivered to the former president. That wasn't all. It's also alleged that in 1971, Jimmy Hoffa had another $300,000 sent as a bribe to Richard Nixon again. This time to commute Hoffa's prison sentence, which he was serving for ironically misusing Teamster funds and jury tampering. We now know that there are rumors swirling around of large cash deposits in the United California Bank belonging to Richard Nixon, some that illegally came from Jimmy Hoffa. And if that wasn't enough, there was another rumor that emerged. A rumor supposedly coming from Hoffa himself, stating that there could be up to 30 million in total stashed at the same bank. Now, we officially know the reason for the thieves wanting to target a bank in California. They heard rumors that the bank they wanted to rob was the location of the illicit cash payments from Hoffa to Nixon, along with the other influx of money that was stashed there. And it was believed that the money was locked in safe deposit boxes in the vault. I'm not a math person, but if the 30 million is accurate, then back in 1972, that would have been close to the equivalent of about 243 million in today's dollars. Again, I tried to make sure the numbers were accurate, and if they aren't, I do apologize. That's ultimately where Emil Denzio decided to step in. Denzio was a career criminal, a master thief who was born in 1936 in the town of Groshen, Ohio. Denzio was described as being one of the most successful thieves in the history of the United States. Emil had a crew that was composed of typically him, his brother James Denzio, and their brother-in-law Charles Mulligan. Emil was an incredibly skilled alarm expert and his brother James was efficient in building bombs and using explosives. Emil Denzio had an interesting life to say the least, being convicted of several crimes through the years, even as recently as the 1990s for a robbery attempt, which was his last time, far past the intriguing history of this story. So finally, Let's get to 1972 when a thoroughly planned heist equally rocked federal law enforcement in the city of Laguna Niguel, California. We have the already noted Denzio brothers and their brother-in-law Charles, the getaway driver on board. But for this job, they needed to add some expertise so they got their nephews Harry and Ronald Barber involved, as well as Phil Christopher, who was another alarm expert, and Charles Brokel. Brokel was brought on purely for strength in numbers as he possessed no real skill. They knew the planning had to be intricate as this was the crime that would become their legacy. Emil had received numerous tips including the supposed numbers for the security deposit boxes. And with that final detail of confidence, they decided it was time to make their move so they traveled to Nigel Laguna from Ohio and began casing the bank. Upon their planning, they realized it would best be served in their favor to go through the roof into the vault which would limit their risk of public exposure. Going through the roof was something that Emil and his brother James had perfected. They hit various scores through the years with numbers very much in the double digits as the brotherly duo were sincerely veterans in their field. With the complex logistics locked down, they decided to put their plans into action. The Thursday night before, they delivered their tools to the eventual scene of their crime. They then injected the alarm systems with an expanding foam to keep the clapping piece from tripping and alerting the authorities. Finally, it's Friday night on March 24th, 1972, and the crew is ready to strike. In first order, they plant dynamite on top of the bank's vault. They blow it open and scale down in. 
They immediately start busting open safe deposit boxes and quickly come across large amounts of cash, gold, and valuables. The totals of cash and value are adding up, but they ultimately find themselves well short of that elusive $30 million. And that is certainly not to undermine the total estimate of $9 million that they did get away with, while again considering the time was equivalent to a far larger amount than what $9 million is now presently. They quickly gather what they've stolen and they head back out under the blankets at night. The scene was eventually discovered and it only baffled law enforcement. It was a testament to the detail and skills that each individual possessed in their role. It was a sign that these were true professionals with experience. This escalated into a frustrating case rather swiftly for the FBI, as the Denzio crew had almost committed a perfect crime, leaving no physical evidence to tie any of the robbers to the scene itself. That was until the FBI was able to link two robberies with similar tactics back to the explosive bandits back in Ohio. The feds found what they believed to be the place where they planned their criminal acts, in relation to one of the barber nephews. When the FBI searched the place, they found fingerprints on dirty dishes that they were able to trace back and match to the bandits. Warrants were eventually pushed out, the robbers were tracked down and soon picked up. Emil and James Denzio, Charles Mulligan, their nephews Ronald and Harry, along with Phil Christopher were all arrested. But good old Charles Brokel decided to rat on his partners in crime before entering the witness protection program. This crime was considered so brilliant that it has been romanticized in film and television, even as recently as 2019 in the film Finding Steve McQueen. Emil Denzio's acts didn't stop there though, but I'm going to deep dive into his life story on its own. I truly hope you all enjoyed another interesting tale about bandits blowing up stuff. I appreciate you watching and thank you for your time.